make money with your art. All right, I am here with Danny Costa, a distributor extraordinaire, and he's going to tell you all about his journey. So why don't you tell us where did you start? Where are you now? Sure. So uh, right out of school, out of undergrad, um, I started working in film distribution. My first job in the industry was as an intern for a little company called Think Film, which has now gone defunct. Uh, that exposed me to independent film distribution at a really professional level. So theatrical releases that uh, went to dozens, if not hundreds, of different theaters across the top 50 markets, uh, releasing films in the kind of multi-million dollar budget space, um, and working with um, films that had enough talent that they were getting solid press coverage, Oscar campaigns, that sort of thing. Um, that was short-lived, and eventually I, I went to work for a much smaller distributor, uh, a company called the Cinema Guild, based out of New York. Been operating for about 40 years, continue to work today. They focus primarily on foreign narrative films and documentaries which are kind of socially conscious and tend to be valuable to the educational market. Uh, worked there for a few years before striking out on my own uh, as a distribution consultant. Um, What's a distribution consultant? So I figured out that uh, a lot was changing in distribution. This is around 2009. Um, in addition to Think Film, a number of other companies went out of business. So uh, that was around the time that New Line Cinema shrunk their staff considerably. Uh, Warner Independent basically shuttered. And it became very clear that independent film was changing. And that, that change really came from digital distribution starting to become the destination for more and more films and DVDs being able to make up less and less revenue as part of the the overall distribution picture. What about in the cinema? What about theatrical distribution? Was that also declining? It was beginning the change, which has kind of fully happened now. Um, so back in 2009, we were starting to see the big problem in indie film, which is still occurring, which is the glut. Starting around 2000. What is that? What's the glut? So starting around 2000, 2000, 2008, 2009. Uh, we started seeing a much larger volume of films being produced, which were shot with DSLRs. And at the time, they had just really hit the market a year or two prior. And that actually made it very, very difficult for film festivals and to some degree distributors to discern what movies are kind of worth considering as far as blind submissions versus what movies can be kind of cast aside as this is pretty obviously terrible and pretty obviously not a real movie. So once that started happening, we started seeing that uh, more and more films were being made that were fairly professional. And you could do it on a lower and lower budget. And the result was that we went from having, just taking a guess, maybe three to 400 films being reviewed in the New York Times each year somewhere in, say, the, the mid-aughts, so 2005, 2006, maybe that's the number you're looking at, to, by 2015, if I had to guess, in excess of 1,000 films being reviewed in the New York Times. Um, the reason that the New York Times is important is because if you screen in, in New York for more than a week, you get reviewed in the New York Times, which obviously has massive syndication and can um, get your film kind of on a lot of people's radar. So this glut, this... Quick question. Shoot. You said if, you're, if your film is screened in New York for more than a week, then you get reviewed in the New York Times. Correct. Does that mean if you have enough money, let's say you're an indie filmmaker, and you rent out a space in New York for one week, then you, you can use that money as essentially a payment to the New York Times to review your film and get some extra press? Correct. You wouldn't be paying the New York Times themselves, obviously. You'd be paying the theater that you forewalled. But um, this is a not uncommon tactic. Uh, How much approximately would that cost? Depends. Um, I know back in around 2010, there was uh, one theater in Midtown that was providing the service for $5,500. Um, for a long time, uh, there was a cinema in, um, on 13th Street called The Quad. And that has four screens, and they would allow one or two of them to be four walled at a time, I believe that was more expensive, something closer to $10,000 USD commitment. Um, I don't know if that program's still running, 
but uh, it was a way, at least for a time, and I don't know if this policy still exists, but for a long time the policy was any theater in the five boroughs pr plays a movie for at least one full week, the New York Times will review it. And you have to tell someone from the New York Times about it, or they somehow find out about it themselves? Uh, good question. I haven't actually walked the walk, so I don't know. I suspect you probably have to notify them. Okay. Now let's get to a question that indie filmmakers want to know, which is how does one generally acquire distribution? Let's say you have a film, you're, a film, you're an indie filmmaker, you have a feature-length film. We can talk about shorts later. You have a feature-length film. It's completed or near completion. So do they just start to call up distributors? Let's assume that they're not in one of the top film festivals. Okay. So I'm going to expand that, that assumption. So let's assume they're not in one of the top film festivals and they haven't raised money or otherwise developed their film in a very public way. Because if either of those two things happen, say for example you raise $100,000 on Kickstarter or as you're trying to raise money your campaign goes viral because you put together an amazing teaser trailer, whatever it may be, uh, then similarly to being in a top film festival, sales agents and distributors are going to find you. But assuming that's not the case, which is not the case for 99% of all filmmakers, um, the most likely way that you're going to secure distribution is by contacting distributors that you've heard of or where they are distributing films you've heard of. Um, probably aggregators because it's unlikely that it's going to make sense for most filmmakers to go to a traditional film distributor just because most films don't really have a market beyond digital releasing. For those who are unfamiliar with what an aggregator is, can you give sure. a quick so aside? An aggregator is a distributor that only handles digital markets. Uh, generally speaking, uh, they take a minority percentage of revenue in the form of royalties. So for every dollar that comes in, they might take 15 to 30 cents off the top. Uh, and the only service they provide is that they get you to digital storefronts like iTunes and Amazon VOD store and the Xbox store. Um, the only other thing that they do is some of them will pitch your film for placement in those digital platforms that are curated. So for example, Netflix or Hulu or Amazon Prime Video, which is free to watch for Prime members, all of those places, they don't just take whatever films get sent to them, they curate those films. And the way that they curate those films is they decide based off of avails lists provided by distributors and aggregators saying essentially, hey, these are all the films I have available that you could distribute, uh, here's some information about them. If you're interested, let's make a deal. In the case of some, like Netflix, they have to actually negotiate a single fee, similar to a broadcast deal. Uh, so for a... And do the aggregators fight for you? Because in my mind, they would receive 10,000 films a year, something like that. So the majority of them probably suck. A vast, I would imagine a vast majority, they don't look at besides the trailer, maybe they make an assessment based on the first two minutes. I could be wrong, I don't know. So what I'm wondering is essentially, you're an someone's an aggregator, you give them the, your film, yeah. you're wondering, how much are they going to pitch my film, fight for my film, market my film, or is it just I'm paying them a fee, they're just, I don't even know if aggregators take a fee, like how does it work? So in, in at least one instance, there is a, an aggregator who will take a fee and We'll just get your film to those storefronts. Fee is around a thousand. No, it's higher. I think it's closer to twenty five hundred. I don't. I don't know specifically, and sure. I don't like to name the distributor because I've actually heard less than positive things about them in from a, a few filmmakers. Um, most aggregators will take a royalty off the top, and in many instances, they will denote certain costs which they can expense back and take from royalties. So, for example. Uh, if they don't do their coding in-house, they might work with a third-party house to a third-party uh, production, post-production house to encode your film to the spec needed to deliver to certain platforms, and that may be $150 a platform, or it may be $1,000 for most of their platforms, and then a couple of them. So there may be various fees in there that get taken off the top too. But generally speaking, it's rare to pay those up front. There is one big glaring exception. 
a company called Gravitas Ventures. Um, I worked with them on the one film I produced and, and, uh, and financed and was positive very- Positive experience? Very positive experience, which is why I'm happy to, to name drop them. Um, they, they actually do require that you cover your costs up front. You don't pay them, you do pay a third party that they say you can go to one of these three encoding houses um, and you have to pay to get like encoding done and in our case, uh, subtitles as well. Um, so that was a cost of, I think, somewhere in the neighborhood of 3,000 USD total. Um, but we were happy enough to do it. And were you able to make that 3,000 USD back? Yeah, in total, uh, I actually have a Medium post up, if anyone's curious, that uh, can be accessed that we'll put up really link. dives into the, the financials. But um, at this point, we made back around seven and a half times our initial investment, and that includes the film and um, all of the distribution costs too. Great, great. Okay, so they do fight for you. Yeah, uh, well, so they will fight for you if there's a reason to fight. So in my case, for example, I, I made a very small film that didn't go to any top film festivals and didn't have any movie stars. So when I gave it to Gravitas, uh, just as a, if I had given it to any aggregator, my expectation would be that it would be delivered to all the digital platforms they work with, and that it would be put on those avails lists that get sent to the platforms. What I knew was that they weren't going to be fighting for me, that they weren't going to be picking up the phone to Netflix or to Hulu or to Amazon and saying, hey, you should check out this film specifically, because there, there was simply nothing that they could show that would have been a good argument, right? There was no, no known stars. There was no film festival appearances that, that really mattered uh, to speak of. So there's nothing to sell in that sense. If they have a reason to sell it, let's say it does star some bankable actors or the film premiered at, say, Telluride or uh, TIFF or Tribeca or Sundance, then I think that's the film that they're likely to say, hey, you know, this might not have gotten a theatrical release, but we have it now. It was at South by Southwest nine months ago, and, you know, it, it got some good reviews and good feedback, so I'd like you to really seriously consider this when they're on the phone with Netflix and Hulu and Amazon, and that's much more likely to, to, to result in a deal when they have those sales points that they can, they can speak to. What does a distribution deal look like, specifically? So for most filmmakers, they get a deal that they can't even negotiate. So I can be fairly specific and say, uh, in, in almost all instances, it's either, uh, for worldwide territories everywhere or all English-speaking territories. Tends to be for all digital markets. So that means your AVOD, your advertising-supported VOD, your SVOD, like Netflix, uh, your electronic sell-through, like iTunes, um, your electronic rental, so VOD, uh, as well as cable telco uh, for those instances in which they can release directly to um, cable and satellite systems, that sort of thing. Uh, and it tends to be that there's uh, no marketing provided, no advertising provided, no promotion of any kind provided. Uh, they often will take somewhere between 15 to 30 percent as their fee. Um, more often than not, it falls somewhere in the neighborhood of 20 to 25 percent. Sorry, more often than not, it falls in around 25? 20 to 25 percent. Oh. And as well as the cut that they take, they sometimes take an initial fee like Gravitas and this other one that you... So the, yeah, in the case of Gravitas, they had me go to a third party and, and pay a fee to them. In a lot of other cases, they'll take, uh, they'll, they'll essentially break down what their fixed costs are uh, for encoding films, and they'll say, this is what we're going to charge you. Um, those will be pulled out of royalties, so you're not cutting them a check. They're just reducing the check that they're gonna pay you by that amount. Yeah, I realized I cut you off when it comes to your journey, so why don't you expand upon that, expound, expatiate. Sure, so uh, I think where we left off was me uh, working as a distribution consultant. Um, that was kind of a new thing back in, in 2009 when I started. Um, but uh, long and short, I was helping filmmakers figure out what to do with their films. Um, and uh, I was lucky enough that um, I had some early clients that uh, had films that really had some opportunity to them. So my first ever client was a childhood friend of mine um, by the name of Damien Chazelle. And uh, his first film was called Guy and Madeline on the Park Bench, which was at the Tribeca Film Festival. It was a feature film? It was a feature film. It was his Harvard thesis film. And, um, and he was in a spot where uh, he just had some questions and I had some experience in distribution. So um, I worked with him a little bit, um, followed by a documentary filmmaker by the name of Noah Hutton 
who had gotten a film into South by Southwest um, that, uh, and it was a film that I really loved, so worked with him on that a little bit. And those kind of early projects got me enough credibility to start bringing in more and more clients. Did that for a few years. Um, at one point I was negotiating on behalf of a client and the distribution company I was negotiating with, it turned out, had recently been purchased. The, uh, one quick question. At this point, you're working for a distribution company or you're working on your own? At this point, I was working on my own. Okay. I was working as a distribution consultant with private clients. Um, I did have this client. Uh, they had a film about um, the Minutemen, who are uh, American militia members who hang out by the U.S.-Mexican border. Um, essentially, they're kind of cosplaying as if they were border guards. Uh, have you ever played Fallout? I haven't. Oh. Fallout 4, there's the Minutemen. Uh, yeah, so I'm sure it's, they all take their name from the, the U.S. revolutionaries. But nonetheless, um, the documentary, since it was uh, on a politically hot topic, was valuable to the educational market. And uh, I was negotiating with an educational distributor that had region, recently been purchased. And uh, one thing led to another. The founder and CEO of the parent company put me in charge of the distributor that I had earlier been negotiating with. So. Uh, that was in 2011. For a few years, I ran that film distributor. Um, What's involved in the day-to-days of running a film distributor company? You ran a whole film distributor company? Uh, yeah, it was a small film, film distribution outfit. Uh, they had a library of 1,100 films, all of them documentaries, and their main focus was the educational market. So, um, you know, it was the same as, as the mandate in any other business to expand revenue and drive down costs. In our case, what that meant was acquiring a higher caliber of films than we had been. Uh, so my primary role, even though I was managing the whole company, was actually acquisitions. And I spent uh, pretty much all of 2012 buying films. So a lot of documentaries from South by Southwest, from the Tribeca Film Festival, um, Toronto, Telluride, um, Hot Docs. Can you give the name of this company? This was uh, Filmmaker's Library. They're still around today, but primarily just as a label. They don't operate in so Let me try and understand this. You're working for Filmmaker's Library around 2000 and... Yeah, running it, starting running. in 2011. 2011, and your main, your main day-to-day job encompassed... Acquisitions. Acquisitions, more than anything, yeah. Then there's probably someone else who does the marketing or does what? So because they had been purchased by a larger company um, by the name of Alexander Street Press, most of the marketing and promotional activities were managed by that larger outfit. Um, there was some expertise brought in from Filmmakers Library because their focus was very film specific, whereas the parent company was more broad based educational video. Um, that said, marketing and promoting film to the educational market is quite different because the buyer is institutional rather than a consumer. You're really trying to sell to a school. Sometimes there is a purchaser, a librarian, who's making these decisions about specific films, but more often than not, you're canvassing a school with your, your brochures and you're trying to make sure that they know everything, that every professor in each topic knows everything available from you in that area. Um, so it's a, a very niche part of the business, but for documentary filmmakers, it's, it's an important market to know because it's lucrative, uh, potentially very lucrative. And that's just one of the markets, the educational market. It's not as if if you get acquired by someone in an educational institution, it bars you from other markets, does it? Unless it does. So there's certain instances in which an educational distributor will ask for a window, just the same way... Like exclusivity? Yeah, so the same way that... Uh, that theaters demand from the studios, hey, you've got to give us 90 days, 120 days before you make your films available on video or Blu-ray or digital download. Um, the, the same thing happens sometimes in the educational market. There are educational distributors that really believe that the film has to only be available through them to be able to capture that market. So it's not uncommon for them to ask for one or two years of a blackout, essentially, where the film can't be made available to regular people, to consumers. So it's important for you as a filmmaker to know about the different types. Of, would you consider filmmakers library an aggregator? No, they're not an aggregator because they don't um, distribute really to, to various digital platforms. They serve their parent company's platform and they would distribute packaged media, so DVDs, Blu-rays, that sort of thing to the end customers, but that's so it. That means, let's say you're a filmmaker, you have a 
could be, it's a feature length film and maybe it's narrative, maybe it's a documentary. You should, as an indie filmmaker with this film, you should know about the various types of distributors and, and well, understand which one is most likely to, which one will give you the, heart, the highest ROI. With documentaries, yes, but it's, it, you really only are looking at two markets in most instances. So again, most films will never make it to theaters. They will never make it to a top film festival. So really they have to think about digital markets. Um, documentaries have one additional thing to think about, which is the educational market. Narrative films, you can't really make money in the educational market in any meaningful way with a narrative film, aside from extraordinary circumstances. So for example, if you have if there is a popular French language film out of France that is culturally significant, then you can likely sell that to a lot of French departments. But short of that, you are not going to be monetizing your narrative film in the educational market. So you really just have to focus on the digital market, and that's primarily served by aggregators. Okay, let's continue on with your journey. So, uh, 2013, um, I left uh, Filmmaker's Library and started working for myself again. Um, basically doing the same thing I did before, working as a distribution consultant. I did decide at that point to put a little money where my mouth was and financed and produced a film in 2013 um, called Not Safe for Work. It was directed and co-produced by a friend and a past client of mine named Ryan Bayless. Um, so that was a fun little side project. We did make some good money on it and it was a kind of a fun case study. Um, but uh, primarily my focus was back to helping filmmakers connect with audiences and the right distributors. And I continue to run that consultancy today, uh, but since I've taken on a couple of day jobs, uh, I am the licensing editor for Sage Publishing, which is um, a fairly large video publisher at this point that's been publishing video for five years and has been providing educational materials to the higher ed market for over 50 years. Uh, so I'm essentially licensing all of their third party video, a lot of documentaries, but some television uh, broadcast material as well. Are documentaries more, you keep mentioning it, are they more likely to get distribution? Is there a higher ROI on them? Well, because you can monetize them in the educational market, it's a safer uh, bet for everyone involved, for filmmakers, for distributors. As long as you make a film that could potentially sell in the educational market, it's one where, uh, especially if you have a, a film where the topic isn't covered that well, you can probably uh, do pretty well. Um, okay. Let's delve into what pretty well means because a lot of filmmakers are listening and they're like, how much money can I make? Now, obviously, obviously it varies, obviously. So why don't we give some numbers starting from probably zero, you can make zero or actually negative because you put up an initial investment and then you'd see nothing back. Yeah. Starting from that to what's the spectrum and yeah, what so does the, dis distribution, the distribution of distributions look like? So let's look at first and foremost consumer facing because both documentaries and narrative films are going to aim to release to consumers, regular people, digital markets. You're right that it starts at zero. Um, I would say most films that get digitally released, which again is almost all films, and that's their only release, most of them will in total make less than 10,000 US. And when I say most, I mean probably somewhere on the order of 95% plus. Now, where does it go up from there? With narrative films, um, you can really only expect revenue that's in excess of, say, the mid five figures if you have been doing a great job developing your audiences and marketing the film, or if the film has some sort of organic success. So, you know, the, the, the term that people most often use is something akin to going viral. Um, but really before that was a common thing, you would see these organic successes be even before the, the days of YouTube. So the, the great example that I think a lot of people look at as far as the past and where this can happen is the Boondock Saints. Uh, Boondock Saints had a very small, like very small theatrical release. But if I remember correctly, they did close to $100 million in ancillary revenue. And that was just through things like word of mouth. Um, so, I would say it's rare to expect, even with a quality film, more than five figures unless you have something special going on. Now that's consumer facing markets. Once you throw in the educational market, which again is only really accessible to documentaries, it really depends on what the scope and focus of the documentary is. If it's a very personal topic, so let's say it's about an artist who the filmmaker knows 
and that artist is not a world famous artist, that is probably going to make zero dollars or close <laughs> to it. If it's about a topic that no one has covered in detail or where the filmmaker has gotten special access to cover in a way that no one has ever been able to do it, then you could find the film making significant amounts of money. And, and what that means for the educational market means deep into six figures. I have heard of films going into the seven figures after um, you know, accumulating for, for many years. But, um, but realistically, it's, it's not impossible to think that a documentary that doesn't get into Sundance, that doesn't get into South by Southwest, but covers the right topics and is done in a really well, well done way and that covers something in a way that no one else has can do hundreds of thousands of dollars in business in the educational space. And when you say hundreds of thousands, do you mean that that is the total amount and then the distributor takes 30% from that or that's the amount that would get delivered to the filmmaker themselves? Yeah, good question. Um, so uh, I was talking about gross revenue to the distributor and it is worth mentioning that in the case of educational distribution, uh, similarly to theatrical distribution, it tends to be that the royalty offered to the filmmaker is actually much smaller percentage wise. The reason being that there's significantly higher cost recognized up front by the distributors to be able to make that, that title available to market. So if you're doing a theatrical release, you know, we're talking about there has to be marketing and promotion, otherwise the theaters just won't book them. And then once the theaters are booking them, the logistics, print costs, that sort of thing. In the case of the educational market, it's printing brochures, it's printing postcards, it's attending conferences, uh, and traditional marketing activities, digital marketing, that sort of thing. What are some things that filmmakers do commonly that are negative, that affect their distribution deals in a deleterious manner? So for example, it's not 4K, I'm just making something up, yeah. or they don't have subtitles, or they go to a distributor two years after the film is done. What are some of the common, and, and what are the ramifications of that? Is that now a done deal? Like, I mean, not a done deal, there's no deal, because your film is too old, you don't have subtitles, you don't have a major, you don't have deliverables. Right, so um, what are the things that filmmakers do that screw them up? Yeah. The number one thing is signing yourself up with the wrong sales agent or distributor. Because there are a lot of bad actors out there. There's a lot of distributors and sales agents that take advantage of the fact that most filmmakers, most artists don't have the expertise to really, really understand what they're reading in a contract, even if they're familiar with contracts. And there's also ample room for obfuscation in accounting. Um, worse yet, a lot of these outfits tend to be small or run from abroad, and that makes pursuing anything legally uh, very, very difficult. Um, it's not uncommon for uh, distributors, or, or I should say people in distribution who are bad actors, to start a distributor, work for three or four years, close up shop, and then open a new LLC so that the past one doesn't have any assets and can't be sued. Or it can be sued, but you can't collect anything. So that's a really big pitfall. And um, I would say a, a good half of my business, maybe more, is filmmakers who have come to me after they have signed up with an agent or distributor who is either incompetent, not a good fit, or a bad actor, never intended on doing right by the film and the filmmakers. That's the biggest thing. The smaller things, rights management. So a great example of this might be in you're a documentary filmmaker and you've got a documentary that's potentially very lucrative for the educational market, but uh, you signed a deal that covers all digital rights with a consumer-facing distributor first, and that means that you can't do a deal with an interested educational distributor either because, well, without the digital rights, they're not interested, and that's, that's probably going to be the case, but also if, um, if they can't uh, potentially uh, black out the film if that's something they want to do and they want to keep it available only to the educational market, they don't have that option. And then finally, um, they may not have uh, any say over how the film is marketed and promoted and that could be a problem. But more often than not, it's a rights issue. So rights management not being done correctly, that's number two. Um, beyond that, most other stuff is fixable. Those two things tend to be very difficult to fix. 
You said most of your job is talking to a filmmaker and then figuring out where should this film go, what is a reputable distributor. Can you give the audience an idea as to what you do and then where they can find out more about you? Yeah, so um, my primary focus is helping filmmakers not screw up. More than anything, it's actually working with filmmakers who don't necessarily have a ton of options, but want to make sure they don't make those mistakes, that they don't want to get in bed with a, a, a bad distributor or a bad sales agent, and um, that they don't want to do a deal that will screw them up. So um, I'm, I, I don't really go looking for clients. I mostly get them from referrals. I do have a website, directcurrentlabs.com, um, which is the name of my company, obviously. Uh, sometimes people find me on Reddit. I did a couple of um, Ask Me Anythings over the years, and, uh, and that seems to be a source of a lot of my clients. Great. And how do you work with the clients? You just charge an hourly fee? Yeah, I charge an hourly fee. Um, it used to be very common for distributors and, not sorry, not distributors, distribution consultants and sales agents to work on commission. Um, but because the revenues on so many films are so small, it doesn't really hold up as a business very well. Um, there are also both sales agents and distribution consultants who require one single large upfront fee. So that's a model I've seen. That's not one that I would feel good about uh, myself. How many hours do you generally someone. work with a filmmaker for? Tends to be in most instances they only need two to four hours because in most instances they don't have that many options available to them. The ones that I tend to have many more billable hours are the films that have a lot more opportunity. So the films that got into South by Southwest or that got into the Tribeca Film Festival and now are being pursued by multiple distributors, maybe in multiple territories, maybe in multiple markets. Um, more often than not, when a filmmaker has a film that hasn't been at a top festival and doesn't have really bankable cast, it tends to be, I'm going to make sure you don't do anything wrong and I'm going to make sure that whoever you sign up with as a distributor is someone that you can trust and who you're not going to have to get in a legal battle with. And more often than not, that only takes two or three, maybe four hours. You mentioned that there's some bad distributors. Okay, so that means there's a set of distributors. Some of them are bad, most, maybe even the majority most. of them are bad. Then there's maybe five ones that, are, that you feel like are reputable. Are you comfortable suggesting these five so that people, if they can't afford your services, not to take away, not to take away a, revenue from you but no no that's fine but that I'm people not, can look and, up on their own to be perfectly frank i don't i don't really operate my consultancy as a business i do some pro bono work i don't like i said i don't seek out clients it's kind of whatever comes my way that i want to work on i'll work on um so i already mentioned gravitas i i was very happy with their work and um really would recommend them to anyone just because they have a very large footprint and because they've always been very transparent with their accounting. And that's really the, the things you're looking for more than anything. You want a distributor who's transparent and trustworthy and who distributes to as many platforms as possible. So other reputable places, they may or may not still accept blind submissions, I don't know. Um, Cinedime, which used to be New Video, they're uh, a very large company um, that I think has a library of something like 40,000 titles. Uh, the Orchard is a company I used to work with as a consultant from like 2009 through I think 2014. Um, they were very reputable and above board uh, and also had a, a fairly wide distribution footprint. They expanded into some theatrical distribution as well. Um, so uh, they're another one that, that I can recommend pretty much bar none to, to people. Um, other than that, there is a content agnostic uh, aggregator, which means they don't really even look at or care about the films that are presented to them. They just take whatever passes QC and uh, they're called Film Hub. And um, I recommend them as a kind of last ditch effort for any filmmaker who's looking to get on digital platforms. Um, I have never worked with them directly, but I have a client who I'm very close with, that filmmaker who I produced a film with, and he's done, I think, seven or eight films with them, distributed with them, and he was very happy with their results and said that they've always been communicative and transparent. Like I said, that's what you want. How do you know whether or not they're transparent before you actually get involved with them? You just search their name up on Reddit and see what other people say? Uh, no, because that, the problem with finding bad distributors is a lot of them also happen to be very comfortable using lawyers. So um, there's a film sales agency that has been 
operating in Los Angeles for uh, over 20 years, I believe. They've been, as far as I see it, scamming people for over 20 years. And the principal of this company will take uh, anywhere from the least I've heard is, is in the, the low thousands. The highest I've heard was close to 20,000 from clients, and they provide very poor services. Um, if they ever get mentioned by name in any publications, in any public forums, they sue. So uh, it's, it's not uncommon for that type of thing to happen. I've run into it a few times where distributors, um, uh, when kind of getting caught with their hand in the cookie jar, when getting caught operating in a way that is not above board, have threatened lawsuit if uh, people disclose that and um, have made people, clients of mine, sign NDAs to kind of get out of those situations. So it's actually really difficult to identify a bad actor. If you're someone who really, really understands contracts very well, there's sometimes some clues in the contract. But um, to be perfectly honest, I wouldn't want to get into that because um, it would take a lot of explanation to give information that would be helpful as opposed to harmful. Um, I will say one of the things that is a good sign is if a distributor has films you've heard of. I'll say another really good sign is if a distributor or an aggregator is willing to give you references that include um, partners, content partners or clients, whatever they call them, but they're filmmakers that work with them who aren't happy with their work. Um, if they're willing to give references, especially people who aren't happy with their work, then that's usually a very good sign that they can be trusted. And then finally, the, the best way to trust a company is if you happen to work with a company that uh, either is publicly traded or is owned by a publicly traded company because that accounting needs to be transparent, otherwise people go to jail. And it needs to be on point and there can't really be anything hidden there. So if you work with a, a company that's traded on a stock exchange, um, that tends to be very, very safe with very few examples. Very few, um, sorry, examples of, of that not being the case. You said that it's important for a filmmaker to have a sales agent or a distribution consultant just because as a filmmaker, you don't know the, the full spectrum of what, is, what constitutes a negative distribution experience. Right, and until or you're, you're, you're fairly uh, seasoned. So until you've, you've gone through it and sold a couple films to distributors and, and gone through that process, or the other way around of, to avoid getting a sales agent or a distribution consultant is if you can find a very seasoned producer, so someone else who's done it and gone through the motions many times, oftentimes they can help you. And the level of expertise in most cases, since in most cases you're just working with one distributor and aggregated, aggregator isn't very high. That's why I only take two to four hours with most of my clients. Most of them don't use 90% of what I know because it's just not necessary. And that same... 10% that they do use, a, you know, a seasoned producer who's been through it a few times can easily guide a filmmaker through that. For those who don't know, can you tell them the difference between a sales agent and a distribution consultant? So a sales agent is responsible for selling your film. Um, more often than not, and I would say in many cases, in, in almost every case, they're going to be contacting the distributor on your behalf. Um, in some cases, they actually structure their deal similar to a distributor. So you you, they structure it in such a way where you hand over the film to the sales agent and the sales agent just does what they need to and you only sign on the dotted line for each deal when they bring it to you. So you're not involved in the process at all. Would you recommend that? Depends. If they're good, sure. Um, again, sales agents, even more so than distribution consultants, sales agents are, are entities you have to watch out for. A sales agents and distribution consultants. Cause so it's risky if you have no idea what you're doing or you're new. Yeah, yeah. There's, so just like distributors, there's a lot of bad sales agents. So that's a so really unfortunate So you need a sales agent thing. consultant. You need someone to, to help guide you. Uh, now that someone can be, like I said, a filmmaker who's worked with a film sales agent and is very happy with their work. Um, or it could be going with a, a well-known name. So Submarine Entertainment out of New York is uh, an extremely well-established film sales agent that I, I know has... Uh, sold a number of high-profile independent films. John Slauson Company is a law firm uh, based out of um, the west side of Manhattan that um, for uh, a long time ran a um, uh, uh, distributor that's now called, an aggregator that's now called Gunpowder and Sky. Um, and, uh, and, and they're reputable and very well-known. But the problem with the very well-known and reputable sales agents is they're very, very selective, and they tend to only engage with films that either have name cast or have been in top 
top-tier film festivals. So unfortunately, for most filmmakers, you're in this very difficult position where you need a guide, but a lot of the guides are not trustworthy. Um, so you're, you're, you know, your best thing that you can do is due diligence. It's asking for references, or it's asking filmmakers, hey, what did you do? I know you were successful. Who did you go with? Were you happy with their work? Um, now, does a sales agent take an upfront fee, much like the distributors themselves or the aggregators themselves? So usually none of them take an upfront fee. Most of the case, if they take an upfront fee, that should be a red flag. Um, it does happen sometimes. Um, if it's a significant upfront fee, it's a very, very big red flag. So if it's, if we're talking about a $500 retainer or a $1,000 retainer, it's no big deal. If it's $8,000, $12,000, $14,000 for their services, and you can't, you know, kind of dip your toe in the water, that's probably not a good sign. Um, and that's the case with the distribution consultant or sales agent. I would be very wary of anyone who charges you a large amount of money up front because there's just no reason. Um, they're, not, they're not risking anything aside from their time, so there's no reason that they can't do things iteratively and say, hey, you know, okay, I'll either go by the hour or let's start with $1,000 and that'll cover this certain suite of services and then the next thousand if we need it, this suite of services, and structure it in a way that a filmmaker can dip their toe in the water and, and gradually get more involved financially. If anyone's asking you to jump in with two feet and can commit a bunch of money, that's usually a bad sign. How are shorts distributed? Is there a market for them? Not really. And I would ask you or most of your, uh, your, your, your fan base, when was the last time you paid for a short? And the answer is probably not a very long time. Um, they can be monetized. It's possible. It's rare. Uh, again, documentaries, you have the educational market available to you. Um, with narrative films, it's much more difficult, but your best bet is probably a national broadcaster if you're in a country that supports the arts. So if you're in the UK, um, there may be broadcasters and distributors that work with shorts, especially ones that have gotten government grants, that sort of thing. Same thing with, with most of Western Europe and to a lesser extent Canada. And the revenue would be I actually don't tiny. know because I've, I've literally never worked with a short. Um, I've seen revenue from documentary shorts, and some of them are, are very successful. Some of them do tens of thousands of dollars in business. Um, because if you're working in the educational market, a 20-minute, 20 25-minute short sells for maybe 100 or $150 compared to um, a feature, which might be 250 to $350. But at at $100, $150 a pop, you can make money pretty quickly with a short, so long it's the right topic, it's well executed, and it's sold by someone who knows what they're doing. When you say you can make about 100 a pop, do you mean that each classroom buys the film? One, I, I, how does that work? So, or every time it's screened, it's, they have to pay $100? Yeah, so I can give you an overview, and there is some, some nuance to it that I won't get into, but the long and short of it is that um, when someone buys a copy of a film, they're not allowed to publicly display that film. That's why there's uh, a warning at the beginning of those uh, VHS tapes, if you remember from when you were younger, that says FBI warning, don't duplicate, don't publicly show. So schools, when they're showing uh, uh, films, in many times that's considered a public screening. The only times it's not considered a public screening is if it meets certain qualifications um, that outlined by a 2008 Supreme Court case. That's in the US, in, the, in Canada, I don't even know what it would be. Um, that, that draws the line. But generally speaking, schools want to be safe and they want to make sure that they're not breaking any copyright laws. So they tend to buy a copy of the film which comes with those public performance rights. Uh, and that's why that same DVD might be $9.99 on Amazon for a feature length documentary, but $350 to sell to a university because even though it's, it's the same physical thing, they are not just getting the physical thing, they are also getting implicit permission to screen that in public with some restrictions. What does a film distributor do that a filmmaker can't do on their own? So you mentioned that as an individual filmmaker, you can't go and pitch to Netflix. Or I don't know if you mentioned it, but you obviously can't. you can't go and pitch to Netflix, Amazon, YouTube. You have to go through an aggregator. How do they do that? Did they develop these relationships beforehand and why can't a filmmaker do that? So yeah, they, they've been developing these relationships and, and the way it basically started was that when Netflix and pretty much every other digital platform starts, uh, their first port of call is let's find out who has content and let's start a relationship with them. So that was the door in for many of the distributors and aggregators that, um, that now work with these platforms. As they've grown, 
they've become more and more inaccessible. So it used to be that Netflix would deal with hundreds of distributors and they would negotiate with somewhere in the neighborhood, according to friends I know who have had these conversations with Netflix, somewhere in the neighborhood of three or 400 distributors. And then a few years ago, for whatever reason, something going on behind closed doors at Netflix, they made the decision that they needed to streamline more and consolidated further. And basically they sent out notes to a number of distributors saying, I'm sorry, but you can no longer work directly with us. If you want your films to be pitched to Netflix, you have to go through one of these like 50 companies. Um, so I think that's something that, that uh, is, is going to continue. We actually would see this back in the DVD days. So uh, Walmart, for example, didn't just deal with independent distributors. Independent distributors had to go through an aggregator of sorts to access Walmart and get their DVDs sold through Walmart. This was back in the day. Uh, so it's just the same thing happening in the digital marketplace with Netflix, et cetera, and I expect that this is gonna continue. The reason being, if you're an acquisitions executive at any of these platforms and it's your job to curate content, you want to be having conversations with as few people as possible so that you don't have to staff up and have a whole team doing it. Instead, it's just you or just three people instead of 30. Because of the glut that you mentioned, there's right. an influx, a higher amount of supply. Too much content, not enough viewers, basically. So they use these aggregators or distributors as gatekeepers or qualifiers. Each one of these is a funnel that, you know, film festivals, aggregators, platforms, they each separate the wheat from the chaff. And the chaff ends up screening for free in those places that will put up anything, YouTube, Vimeo, etc. As long as it meets quality control, technically speaking, and as long as it doesn't violate the terms of service, you put it up. That's the low end of the spectrum. The high end of the spectrum, the most inaccessible distribution is theatrical, wide theatrical. And really, almost all filmmakers fall on the very low end of that spectrum with digital only, and most of them will never end up in any of those platforms that require curation. So they'll never end up on Netflix, Hulu, Amazon Prime Video, et cetera. All right, Danny, let's continue off from your journey. Yeah, so, uh, well, nowadays I'm, I'm still consulting. I'm um, uh, taking on just a couple clients at a time and I'm uh, teaching. So um, Teaching distribution, teaching film, or unrelated? Uh, right now I'm teaching... Um, a couple of things. I'm teaching uh, film distribution, the business of film distribution in a couple of nonprofits here in Toronto. Um, I'm just started teaching an audience development course at Sheridan College. Uh, and, um, and that's basically it uh, as far as teaching goes. But that's something I'm going to continue and maybe try to grow. Um, by day, I'm, I'm licensing content, uh, again, on behalf of, of my employer, Sage. Um, and uh, other than that, um, starting to think about maybe making another movie, but we'll see. Okay, we have a question from someone from the Indie Film TO audience, and they want to know, how does one get cinematic or theatrical distribution like Cineplex? Yeah, so theatrical distribution is really challenging. Um, there's a couple ways you can do it. The traditional way is that you get signed up with a theatrical distributor, and um, they do their job, essentially, which is to start marketing, promoting the film, uh, make it available and coordinate with theaters um, and take in that revenue. Um, they, from a strategic standpoint, will also handle the rollout of the film. In most cases, for most independent films, that might mean starting out in one or two cities that make the most sense. For a lot of films, it's New York and Los Angeles, especially if they've been at a top tier film festival and they're kind of already on people's radars. But for a film that's, say, about a specific topic, so let's say it's a documentary and it's about um, a, a cowboy competition in Texas, it might not be uh, a good idea to start in New York and Los Angeles. Instead, it might be a good idea to be booking theaters in Houston and Dallas and Austin. So those are things the distributor would, would help manage. And that's the traditional way. For other filmmakers who don't go with a traditional distribution deal, they don't have too many options. They can four wall a single theater um, by renting it and They'll get to play it and maybe they'll make some money, but that's a pretty hard slog. Or they can work with a company that helps facilitate um, screenings on demand. So Tug is a great example of this, um, where if you can get a certain threshold of people to buy tickets in a certain city uh, for a certain screening, that screening will essentially be turned on and will be scheduled at that theater and those people can go 
and see the movie there. Uh, so that's one way filmmakers have uh, kind of leveraged technology to, to be able to do screenings just here and there in pockets where there's particular interest in their film. By and large, that's the only way it's accessible. Some people do try touring their film. Um, and I've, I've seen and heard of filmmakers doing that successfully. There's a guy by the name of Todd Sklar who did this uh, with a film called Box Elders uh, a couple year, years ago and now runs a, a film touring and marketing company. Um, but again, uh, there have to be some, some fairly special conditions in place and you have to be really very, very good at grassroots marketing to make that something where you're not going to lose a, a fairly significant amount of money. So as a filmmaker, once, once you give your film to a distributor, it's still in your hands somewhat to market? If you're working with a traditional distributor who's doing your full suite of services, so they're doing a theatrical release, et cetera, they are going to handle that for you. But again, that's very rare. That's only if you've got a film that's, that's really desired by the market. Uh, for the 99% of filmmakers, they don't somewhat have to handle the marketing. It is completely their responsibility and no one's going to do any promotion, marketing, advertising at all. All they're gonna get is the logistical support. We are going to take your film, we're gonna put it on digital markets, on digital platforms where we can, and those places where we can't, where it's curated, we're gonna pitch them, and that's it. Once your film is on some place like, well hopefully, some place like Netflix, Amazon, Hulu, do you make more money the more people watch it? No, and in fact, in the case of Netflix, they won't even tell you how many people watch it. So you won't even know if it's a success or not, only they know. They just give you a fee, or give they the distributor a fee, and then the Right, they give uh, whoever is the current rights holder. So if you've licensed your rights to a distributor, the distributor, if you've licensed your rights to an aggregator, the aggregator, in extraordinarily rare cases where you know, you're Kevin Smith, uh, maybe the check comes directly to you. Um, but, uh, but in most cases, yeah, it's going to your distributor and it's getting uh, divided out over the course of the term. So if it's a $10,000 check and it's over the course of one year, you'll get four checks for two hundred dollars uh, for $2,500 rather than one $10,000 check. Lastly, let's just give a synopsis, a summation of what we talked about, a step-by-step. -step. So you're an indie filmmaker, you have a film, maybe there's two different processes if you have a narrative or a documentary, but why don't you just give a step-by-step -step overview? Yeah, so for, for narrative films, um, unless your film is already successful, right, unless you're getting into top festivals or you've got a, a fairly big budget and a fairly well-known cast, your first port of call is to find someone you trust who knows the industry enough to be able to see a bad distributor and then um, to work with that person to get you in the hands of an aggregator. Um, probably one of those aggregators I mentioned, maybe another one that, um, that I didn't that's reputable. And that's by and large it. From then on, you, you, know, you, you really want to focus all your energy on marketing. I would say for most filmmakers, their marketing should start in development. For most filmmakers, they should be thinking about distribution when they're in development, not at the end. And they should be trying to, to, to build up these tools so that they can market the film effectively once it's actually available. Uh, for documentarians, it's pretty much the same thing. Find someone that you can trust who's more experienced than you, who can help steer you away from bad distributors. If it seems appropriate, find an educational distributor first and then find an aggregator to bring you to digital markets later. Um, how much later will depend on how things go and, and what kind of deal you strike with the educational distributor. But other than that, it's pretty much the same as with narrative. You focus your, your energy on marketing and promoting, making your film stand out because thousands and thousands and thousands of films are being made available every single year and the number of viewers is not growing. If anything, it's shrinking uh, as more kind of distractions come online, as more uh, people grow up watching YouTube and not movies, uh, spending their time on Instagram and not on television. Uh, films in a difficult place. So really the name of the game is Rise Above the Noise. But actually the first step is to contact this guy. And he'll tell you exactly what to do with your film so that you can become a millionaire. Okay, and that, those, that comes from him. He told me that offline.